where you're joining from today. My name is Eric Kimberling. This is our weekly Tuesday live stream that we do every Tuesday at the same time. Um, this is a way to get audience involvement in our weekly podcast, which is Transformation Ground Control. Every Wednesday, we release new episodes of Transformation Ground Control. But on Tuesdays, we do the live recording uh, with our centerpiece guest for that episode. Every Wednesday, and we release new episodes of Transformation Ground Control. And today we're going to talk about um, manufacturing, industry 4.0, and uh, just manufacturing in general, and digital transformation within manufacturing. So I'm excited for our guest, who I'm going to introduce here in just a moment. But before I do that, just real quickly, a uh, couple of logistical things for the audience purposes here. Um, first of all, we're streaming to a bunch of platforms today, uh, primarily LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So if you're joining on any of those platforms, please feel free to chime in with questions as we get to our guest here today. Um, any question related to manufacturing, digital transformation, we're, we're here to take whatever questions we can and uh, make that as interactive as possible. So please feel free to drop in the chat any questions you have along the way. Um, secondly, if you could, as we're getting started here, just drop in the chat where you're joining from today. We, have a, we typically will have a global audience for this uh, live stream. So I'd love to hear where you're joining from today. Just let us know what city and country you're in uh, here today, just so we have a sense of who our audience is. So um, today, what we want to cover is uh, Industry 4.0 and the future of manufacturing. So we're talking about digital transformation in the world of manufacturing, but um, we want to get more specific into some of the trends that manufacturers are seeing uh, within um, the manufacturing space. So for that conversation, we thought it'd be great to have Walker Reynolds on the show, who is the chairman of Intellic and CEO and solution architect at 4.0 Solutions. And I'll let him describe a little bit more what those companies do. Um, but in the meantime, Walker, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yeah, great, great to have you. So um, I guess just to start, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background as well as 4.0 Solutions and Intellic and what, what you do in your current roles. Yeah, so I'm, um, uh, my journey's a long one, but uh I'm, uh, I've been in industrial automation 23 years now. Um, I, and my, I have a life's mission of helping to save and create middle-class jobs. That's literally my life's mission. Everything I do, every business I own, every venture I create, every partnership we forge is all in service of that one common mission to help save and create middle-class jobs in the United States. Initially, my goal was to do that through education. So I have an undergraduate degree in sociology. I, had, I did all my graduate work in education. But while I was putting myself through grad school, I worked in a mine. I got a job as a laborer in mine, in a mine, and I got introduced to industrial automation. I had, I've always been a techie guy. I've always been the, the guy who tore apart my toys on Christmas morning. And, you know, I had a certification in five volt DC systems and stuff. And so I could read IEC drawings and that's sort of where that confluence happened. The boss knew I could read some, I could read IEC drawings. We had a piece of industrial equipment that hadn't operated in a long time. We had an electrician who couldn't read the drawings. They put us together so I could read the drawings and help, help him troubleshoot this piece of equipment that hadn't run in a year. PLC operated remote control, you know, the whole deal. And it was basically in three days I learned you know, the basics of industrial automation, and I was able to fix the machine. And overnight, <laughs> I became the expert at this equipment. And so then I went back to school, double E, you know, six, over a five-year period, I, I literally transformed my career and it became my path forward. So I spent the first 10 years of my career working for the end users. So I, I charted a path to be ultimately become a systems integrator, to become a consultant so I could help as many manufacturers as I possibly could. Spent the first 10 years working for end users. So I did mining, printing, um, uh, steel industry, tier one automotive. Then I went and worked for a couple of integrators here in Texas. And then I started my own integrator. Um, and then that was in 2015. Today in 2022, 49 companies later. <laughs> so I have 49 companies now. Uh, five of them are in the industrial automation spe uh, space. Two of them are in Intellic Integration 4.0 Solutions. Intellic Integration is the first full service systems integrator, industry 4.0. So that is, we approach every project as one part of a bigger whole, part of a digital strategy for an organization. We're fully agnostic. So we don't sign any vendor relation partnerships. Um, uh, if we have vendor strategic partnerships, they what it means is that those vendors share the same common values that we have and want to serve the exact same mission. But there's no quid pro quo. We're that we're we're wholly agnostic. 
Um, and then 4.0 Solutions does education and outreach. So we train engineers how to do industry 4.0 projects and we train leaders on how to lead them. So we have two products. One is mentorship, one is mastermind. And you can find out more about that at iiot.university. That is where our online university is located. We manage a Discord server, the Industry 4.0 Discord server, which I think has over 4,000 members now. Um, and then we have, I think, uh, 18,000 subscribers on YouTube. We've been doing content since like 2018. And that's sort of how everybody found out who we were. But there's an architecture that we designed that's pretty fam world famous architecture. We won a bunch of awards for it. And, um, and that's basically what we teach. Very cool. Yeah, that's very cool. And that's actually how I found you was on YouTube. Um, I, I was in, 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 I was fascinated by your, by your channel and some of your content. So it was, it was really good stuff. And um, like we talked about in prepping for this discussion, your conversational style and the way you bring some pretty complex topics down to earth and sort of at, at the level a lay person can understand is, is pretty fascinating. And I, I owe that to my professors, by the way. So when I was doing my graduate work in education, I wrote my thesis in constructivism, which is a educational model on how to use, um, you know, how you can use math, English and science. I can teach a lesson in science that serves an English um, purpose. I can I can teach a lesson in math that serves an English purpose. And one of the keys of constructivism is being able to break down very complex ideas into very simple elements to teach and so mm. i really do owe that to my my graduate professors i wasn't born with that skill right <laughs> well good so so i guess i have to ask a question this is off script already and you know leave it to me to be the first to go off script before i ever am on script but uh, i have to ask that i'm fascinated by your mission to save middle class jobs where, where did that come from is that it's yeah. you said it's your lifelong mission how did that originate so i'm um so I'm from Texas. I lived in Texas till I was seven. My mom died when I was really young in a uh, in an act of domestic violence. My mom was th this is all part of the the whole the story. Mm -hmm. uh, my so my mom um, got killed by my stepdad when I was seven, and and wow. so I got adopted by a family in upstate New York. So I think by virtue of the fact that my mom died when I was really young, I and um, my brother and I were the ones who found her body. So I went through this horrible, horrible thing as a kid. Wow. But but the the thing is, is I went through the worst thing I was ever going to go through at seven. So I and I've known that my whole life. So you think about that, like all of the mm -hmm. biggest challenges I've faced in my career, in relationships and anything like uh, uh, an asshole boss is nothing to me. Right. right. Uh, an executive who makes twenty five million dollars a year and thinks that he's the smartest person in the room and dismisses the ideas of people on the plant floor just because he's the one who went to Wharton. That guy's nothing to me. He, he, I dealing with him is pales in comparison to what I went through as a kid, but I got adopted in upstate New York in the eighties in 1982. And obviously I don't need to tell people that was right at the beginning of the third industrial revolution, about t 10 years in give or so give or take. And that's when Americans got crushed. American manufacturing got absolutely destroyed by Germans and Japanese because they adopted industry 3.0 long before we did. And industry 3.0 is the automation of industrial processes, right? So they adopted the technology American companies didn't. So mm -hmm. what happened was in order for American companies to remain viable, thank you, Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca is the one who said, let's go ahead and outsource our supply chain and let's go chase cheap labor. And that's what everyone else did just to stay alive. And so what happened was, all the manufacturers in, in the Northeast, which we like to call the Rust Belt, they did this mass exodus, right? They all, they went to Mexico, they went to China, they went, they went wherever they could find cheap labor just so they could stay alive. Now, Americans all thought, we all thought it was just corporate greed, right? And so let's put in trade policy that makes it hard for them to do that. No, it was, it was business need is why they did that. And I learned that in college in the 90s. So I, in the, in the 80s, I saw my friend's parents go from, middle class, upper middle class to work in a gas stations overnight, like all the jobs were gone. Right. Wow. And so I, I, I knew that I, I saw it with my own eyes, the corollary between g manufacturing and a vibrant middle class. And then the corollary between a vibrant middle class and social stability. Right. So if you mm -hmm. look at all the, all the rage culture we have in the United States, all the you know, all the conflict that we have socially, all of that is an extension of the decline in the middle class, every single bit of it. Right. And so mm -hmm. 
when I was in college, I learned, I took a bunch of labor courses when I was studying sociology and I learned, no, those companies left because they had to. Now, it wasn't corporate greed. They wanted, executives want to keep the jobs in the United States. And, and by the way, we work with companies all day long. Every executive that we talk to, their goal is to keep Americans employed. They're not like, oh, hey, how can I offshore this? They're not thinking that. They're only offshoring as a last resort. So right. in that first job that I got in mining, sort of everything came together. What I experienced in the 1980s, okay, what I, what I learned in school in the 1990s. And I was like, in the 1990s, I was like, ah, I want to I help rebuild the middle class. I don't know how to do that. I thought I was going to do it through education. But then I got introduced to industrial automation. And I realized, wait a minute, I can get on the ground. I can actually boots on the ground, transform manufacturing in the United States during this fourth industrial revolution. So when TCP IP won the protocol wars in the late 90s, it all sort of came together. Wait a minute. Americans could be the first to digitally transform, truly digitally transform. And by the way, we have. We, are, we lead the world in digital transformation. And, and as long as we keep our foot on the gas, and we keep winning over manufacturers one at a time, what will happen is the middle class in the United States is going to grow through technology positions, the, the employee of the future in manufacturing, and operations analysis. That's, that is the future of employment in the United States, full stop, and that's what our mission is. Interesting. Well, that's a very, very cool story, and it's, it's um, fascinating how it's such a personal thing for you, and you don't hear that often in in our world, you know, digital transformation, it's, it's usually about the tech and, you know, what, what cool new, uh, sexy technology can we roll out? But, but to you, it's a lot deeper than that. It's, it's oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are, we are a values based organization. So, uh, we, we operate on five core values. They are our values. So transparency, authenticity, expertise, humility, servant leadership. And we, and we operate in service of one mission to help save and create middle-class jobs by helping manufacturers do more with less using technology. That's, that is our mission, full stop. And to the point, to, to even this point, I am the chairman of the board at Intellic Integration. I don't have anything to do with the operations, day-to-day -day operations. I'm just the chairman. I'm in one meeting a month, right? Board meeting. And then I'm the, the chairman at 4.0 Solutions. I know nothing about the finances of those companies at all. I get, I get an update once a month at Intellic and I get an update once a month at 4.0 Solutions. I know nothing. I can't tell you how much money's in the bank. I don't know. Unless I've just received the report, I can't tell you what's in the whip or anything. Why is that? Because if I know the financials, if I know the financials, then my motivation will change, right? That's human nature. So I focus on mission, strategy, vision. That's it. And there are other people in the organization who are tasked with keeping us in business. But we are not in, we don't make money because that's our goal. We make right. money so we can change the world. Right. Yeah. Very cool. And it's, I think that's, uh, as Parisa just sort of took the words out of my mouth on LinkedIn, it's, it's, it's inspiring, you know, to have that, that sort of, uh, that bigger picture, longer term goal. Uh, yeah, we, we call it principled capitalism, right? You know, this is, this is why Elon Musk is so loved. Elon Musk is so loved because he's a principled capitalist. He, right. He's a capitalist so that he can change the world and save humanity. Right. right. He's not a capitalist so he can buy a 500 foot yacht. Right. I mean, you right. can you can tell the difference between Bezos and Elon. Right. Bezos is a pure capitalist who's ridden off into the sunset to spend his billions and and build a 500 foot yacht. Elon doesn't even own a house. Right. right. I mean, that that's the difference. Right. The difference is he's a principled capitalist and I am in that camp and 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 our partners are in that camp. Every single if you look at anybody we work with, the first conversation I have with a company when they call us is tell me about your values. What do you believe? And right. and if and if and if our values don't align, we don't even have a discussion about synergy at all. Right. Right. Very cool. So I, I guess just before I get to some questions here, just to acknowledge our audience here and thanks to everyone for joining the, the live stream here. Um, we have people from uh, Caratero, uh, Denver, Colorado, Paradise, Texas, uh, Toronto, um, Melbourne, Norway, Manchester, England, Bergen, Norway, um, Hanafos, Hanafos, Norway. John John on YouTube is, is also in Norway. A lot of people from Norway here, um, Atlanta, Georgia. So we've got a combination of obviously some people from the U.S. and most not from the U.S. I'll be curious to hear feedback from the audience on on whether that whole 
middle class um, dynamic resonates with you in your in your home country as well. Um, but just to start here, um, just to maybe set some context, you, you mentioned Industry 3.0 and Industry 4.0 throughout the conversation so far. Maybe just help us understand what is Industry 4.0 and how is that different from the way things work back in the 80s when you were first when you're talking about Industry 3.0? So, yeah, it's it, so very important to note industry 4.0, the term actually started out um, in the, the early 2000s. There's a there's a holy war in, in our in, in our industry. What is industry 4.0? There is a camp that says industry 4.0 is the specification written by the EU to tell manufacturers how to um, use data, right? How to capture data and use data. And there's this whole maturity model and it starts with computerization and all this stuff. That's all horseshit. It didn't work. The EU all <laughs> says it didn't work. In fact, the EU, there's all reports now that says, listen, this was that that standard wasn't worth the paper it was written on. That doesn't mean that the people who wrote it don't know what they're doing. It was that they just took the wrong step first. That's all it was. Industry 4.0 starts with education, right? That's where that's what it is. What is Industry 4.0? It's the fourth industrial revolution. As a so as a sociologist, what I know is that our industrial revolutions are they are they're not something human beings created they are they are a natural evolution of progress period if you create if you create intelligence on another life on another planet and they're not human beings they will go through five industrial revolutions okay we we know they'll go through five dust mm -hmm. and they'll happen at the exact same interval and they will and they'll happen in the exact same order so the third industrial revolution was the automation of manufacturing processes so if we start with Number one, number one, industry 1.0 was really the steam engine. Uh, industry 2.0 was the assembly line. Industry 3.0 was the automation of industrial processes. It was the automation of the equipment that's in the assembly line. Right. That was, that was done two ways. Number one, relay logic, which is just wires and ice cube relays. And number two, with computers. And, and at the back end of industry 3.0, you put programmable logic controllers on all these machines, and th and those programmable logic controllers created massive amounts of data. The fourth, but nobody captured it. Right. <laughs> they, didn't were, they didn't know what to do with it. The data is on the equipment, and they and, and there and there are tens of thousands of events. Right. So, uh, what is data? It's something that happened and when it happened. Digital data means it's ninety nine point nine 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 percent accurate, and it comes from a smart thing. The fourth industrial revolution really started right around 2000, and it was the ability to collect the data, collect the data and transform it into information so that you could automate business processes. So the fourth industrial revolution is just this space and time that we're in. Now, it's important to understand Moore's law, which is Moore's law applies when it comes to the industrial revolutions, which is each industrial revolution, each subsequent revolution is half as long as its previous one. OK, so the the fourth industrial revolution is only running from about the year 2020 or 2000 to 2032, give or take ballpark. OK, the fifth industrial revolution, which will be augmented reality and virtual reality. That is, we're walking around with a heads up display and every physical thing we look at, we have digital data over will be in both the metaverse and in the real world at the exact same time. That's the fifth industrial revolution. Right. Um that will start right around 2032 for real in earnest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So most manufacturers have another 10 year window to get this, to, to become a smart company. Okay. To smart, become a smart company. And then from the, by extension from a smart company, become a data company, all manufacturers full stop during the fourth industrial revolution will have one of three things happen to them. Number one, they will go out of business. Okay. Number mm -hmm. two, they will get acquired by another company who becomes smart. Or number three, they will become a data company. I see this thing on Twitter all, all the time. These stock analysts, Tesla's overpriced, right? Here, Tesla's worth a trillion dollars. Well, not today, but it will be again, right? So Tesla's worth a trillion dollars. The next 10 biggest auto manufacturers combined are worth a trillion dollars. Does anyone think Tesla's overpriced? And my answer is, hell no, you're an idiot. Tesla is not a car company. Tesla is not a car company. They are a data company who makes cars. Their primary commodity is the Gigafactory, which doesn't have to make cars. It can make anything. The Gigafactory is designed to make anything. 
Okay. It is an infrastructure. Giga is an infrastructure. It's not a manufacturing facility. It's not deterministic. Okay. And number two, they're a data company. The car is merely the vessel through which Tesla collects its most valuable commodity, which is data. If you don't become like that, you are dead. That yeah. is what the fourth industrial revolution is. And it wasn't possible really until about 2000. We, hit, we needed networks, we needed smart things, and we needed software to put it all together. And that's when it happened. Right. So it's interesting to hear you sort of put that in context, not just the historical context, the context of where we are today, but also where we're headed in the future from 2032 on with Industry uh, 5.0. Um, that's super interesting. And it's interesting to think about those organizations that are still stuck in Industry 3.0. You think of all the companies out there, and I imagine you probably consult with a lot of them, too that they haven't even come close to getting to industry 4.0, which is a prerequisite, by the way, to getting to 5.0. You can't just, I assume you're not just going to jump from 3.0 to 5.0 someday and just, just wait till that next wave. Nope. <laughs> you have to become, you have to become a smart company in order to become a data company. And you have right. to be a data company to go through the fifth industrial revolution. And, and the question is what do manufacturers have to do? And, and, you know, honestly, it, it's not that hard. It, I mean, it's painful, but it's not that hard. There's a playbook for doing it. The problem is, is that the, the playbook that the, the, the most of the OEMs that manufacturers are going to are not going to OEMs who give a shit about your digital strategy. They're not even asking you about your digital strategy. What they're looking for is a list of projects they can work on, use cases. But, it, but if, you don't, if you don't put all of those projects, those use cases, all the th problems you're going to solve within the context of a much larger digital strategy on a common technology filtered through minimum technical requirements so that you can create an ecosystem, which is the industrial internet of things. If you can't create a common ecosystem on common technology, you're wasting your money. And so who, who should you not go to? If you're going to Rockwell and you're asking Rockwell Automation, and if you have a partnership with Rockwell, I apologize. But <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're going to Rockwell Automation and you're saying, hey, Rockwell, come in and consult with us and give us the connected enterprise. You're screwed. Full stop. You're not going to find a single architect who doesn't work for Rockwell who isn't going to tell you the same thing I just told you. Okay. The the if you're doing that, what you're getting is a, a solution. You're getting a Rockwell solution. Okay. Right. What you need is a uh, think of it as a quilt. Your your technical infrastructure is a quilt of all the best solutions from all OEMs connected together on common technology. That's what we teach using a concept called the unified namespace. So, but manufacturers, it's, this isn't that hard. You become a smart company over the course of a three to five year window. And that's connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize, find patterns, predict, report, solve. Once you're a smart company, then you plug into a digital supply chain. So instead of just talking to the links upstream and downstream from you, you're talking to all the links, including the links you don't work with yet. That's what, that is what smart companies do. Smart companies make products that get better after you buy them and they plug into a digital supply chain. That right. it's just, it's, it's simply that simple. So if you're a manufacturer watching this or you work for a manufacturer watching this, you need to ask yourself, are we on that path? Hmm. Is that where we're going? And if not, you're dying. It's, it's just that simple. Yeah. You're falling yeah. further and further behind. Yep. Yeah. Well, so I've got a few comments I want to get to here and then a question too uh, from the yep. audience. Um, but first of all, I have to you hit a few comments here. I think, uh, I don't think it's it's pretty clear that your uh, your personal story and your personal mission uh, has resonated and struck a chord with the audience here. Um, someone from LinkedIn that doesn't show the name uh, says, I'm sorry it happened to you as a child, but totally agree this horrible experiences make you, make you strong, stronger. Uh, Parisa on uh, LinkedIn also says that's an inspiring mission. With passion, there's nothing that can stop you, uh, which I totally agree with. Um, and then a, another comment here that extreme childhood trauma to make good in the world. Amazing. So I think that's a really cool um, story. And um, let me, I'd like to give uh, Zach, Zach Scriven, who's my digital media strategist credit here. Uh, for a very long time, I didn't talk about this story. I, I mean, I talk, everybody in my, in my circle knew about it and I would talk about it and they knew it. You know, I talked to my employees and everybody, but publicly I didn't talk about that story. Yeah. Zach, I mean, that's hard to talk about. I mean, I imagine that's probably not the easiest thing to bring up. Zach said one, you know, there's a there's a video we shot a couple of years ago where I'm walking through a marina in upstate New York. And it's the story of Walker Reynolds. And Zach is saying, listen, you need to tell your 
like your life story. Like, and I, and he wanted me to do this for months. And I kept saying, Zach, no one cares about that. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go to this. And, he, and Zach insisted over and over and over again, you're wrong. Like you're wrong. This, it's a key part of, of how you've gotten to where you are. And you have to tell that part of it. Like the, the audience needs that context. So I want to give Zach all the credit because it was never my idea to, to ever even mention it. But now when that question does come up, I do tell that part of the story. And it's because Zach insisted, hey, th that context is important. So Zach, thank you, brother. But and it's a it's a reminder too that we all, you know, being in the professional services space as you and I are, I mean, it's it's we're all human and we want to work with humans and flawed or not, or you know, the imperfections that go along with that. And the, that's the authenticity. That, that that's authenticity. That's you yeah. know, it's um it's uh Americans crave authenticity because there is so much um I don't want to say fakeness, it's not that it's it, there's so much production in the world, right? There's so yeah. I, I think fake is too hard of a word. Uh, I think I, we, we crave authenticity and, and the interesting thing is the the nature of work is changing, right? It used to be like when our career started and I, I'm assuming Eric, you're around my age, right? So when, when our, when our career started, you, there was a, there were clear lines in the sand between work and home, right? right. You were either at home or you were at work and this is home time and this is work time. That's changing that. I mean, it has changed. You are always at work and you are always at home. And so therefore, the values that you have at home need to merge, need to merge into the values you have at work. So now what I encourage people to do when they're going to find an employer, it's not benefits and income. And it's I don't even talk about any of that stuff. What I talk about is you need to go find an employer who has, shares the values you have and they don't just put they don't just write it down and put it, you know, it's a mission statement that they don't really work towards or it's values they don't really have. You need to ask questions about real values because you're always going to be at work right. and you're always going to be at home. And and that and that's the nature of what I think drives us towards authenticity is we want authenticity at home. We expect it at home. And because we're always at work and always at home in this new economy, we, we need authenticity at work as well. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. That's that's really well well said. Um, here's a here's a comment I want to sort of springboard into a question for you, uh, Walker. And this is from Michael on YouTube. He says, "Absolutely resonates with me in Mexico. As the southern neighbor of the U.S., it is good for both countries that Mexico gets rich and be, rich and becomes a better customer of U.S. products and services." Yep. So I, I guess just to maybe back up a little bit and turn that into a question as it relates to to the more global scale here. Um, how does everything you're talking about, as far as the um, you know, wanting to help the middle class and in, in the in the did we lose Eric? Whole into a U.S. centric uh, mission of sorts. Um, so the answer is this. It, um, so uh, Michael Dowdell, the guy who answered the asked the question. We we know Michael. I I know what company he works for. He's a visionary thought leader. Um, you know, the customers that Michael works with in Mexico, the vast majority of them are, are suppliers for American companies. Okay. And American consumers are consuming the goods for the most part are consuming the goods from the suppliers that the sub assemblies that go into the finished goods that Michael serves. Though they don't go anywhere, those suppliers don't go anywhere. Those suppliers start making products that are bought in Mexico through a thriving middle class that is grown in Mexico. What we did by offshoring supply chain into Mexico is we created the infrastructure for the for Mexico to have their supply chain for the consumer economy. That that's the that's the difference. The mm -hmm. difference is is that we create new suppliers here in the United States who's who are manufacturing the goods you know it, as a function of logistics manufacturing the sub assemblies that go into the finished goods but the but the here's the fundamental difference this this is the biggest key difference operations analysis and if you look at our clients our clients have manufacturing facilities all over the world but they no longer have manufacturing facilities all over the world to manufacture goods as cheaply as possible to sell them in the United States for the biggest margins. No, they manufacture in China to sell in China. They manufacture in Mexico to sell in Mexico. 
They manufacture in Costa Rica to sell in South America. But what do they do? What do they what do they do with the data they collect in those manufacturing facilities? They aggregate it in a common infrastructure and they use U.S. based engineers, data scientists and operations analysts to optimize their manufacturing operations in their offshore facilities. That is the that's the new economy for the United States. Why? Because a, as an industrial nation, the United States, Germany, Japan, you know, all Western Europe, Germany, Japan, um, United States as the three key leaders, we're so far ahead of um, other industrial economies. Our economy transforms as a fourth industrial uh, or an industry 4.0 economy before Mexico's does, right? Mexico. But one of the things, some interesting things about company uh, countries like Mexico, we had to go through the physical infrastructure first. We needed a lot of copper all over our country right? Mm -hmm. Telephone lines, you know, ethernet cables. Countries like Mexico don't have need that. Me Africa doesn't need that. Uh, India doesn't need that. Now it's all 5G. They'll be able to put infrastructure in place much, much faster than we did. And mm -hmm. so they will catch up at the speed of light to, to where the we Western Europe is, the United States is, Germany, Japan, et cetera. That's super interesting. I never, yep. I never connected those two data points into, into that context. That's, that's a really interesting point. So in some ways, what you viewed as maybe a disadvantage in the past of not having that infrastructure in some of these countries that maybe they're an advantage now because they can catch up faster. That's the good news. Absolutely. And, 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 and in the United States, think about it. There, there are many many. What did, what did we do when we onshored operations here in the U.S.? We moved to rural areas. OK, we, we went to the place where there were lots of farms so that we could get farmers to work in our manufacturing facilities. Right. Well, those places generally don't have a lot of infrastructure. So if you look at one of the barriers for manufacturers to start collecting data and aggregate it centrally and, you know, get their data into huge data lakes so they can do big data analytics, it's infrastructure is one of the key problems, right? They're having to right. spend lots of money. 5G changes all of that. So now 5G literally overnight, you know, you can't collect all your data over 4G LTE. It's too slow. It's only 25 meg, right. give or take. 5G gives you a 100x uh, increase in, in uh, decrease in latency and a 100x increase in bandwidth. You can literally collect all your data over wireless infrastructure using 5G. And we shot a video on this about, hey, the implications of 5G are legit. They're, they're real. Lit literally, once we have the 5G infrastructure in place, there is no smart thing on the planet that you can't collect data from without having to put infrastructure. You don't have to put the infrastructure in. It's there. It's all around us. When you leave your home, You'll be on the same network at home as you are when you get to work. As in, instead of right now, I'm on, uh, I'm on a, a an encased network at my house, right? Same thing when I go to work. I'm in a completely different network. With 5G infrastructure, you're on one common infrastructure, right. and that's that's gonna that's a huge game changer for emerging economies like Mexico. And by the way, Mexico's economy is much closer to ours than it is to say Africa or something. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in Mexico. Mexico is incredibly advanced. They got very, very smart workers. They, you know, they're highly educated workers. I mean, they're, they have fundamentally transformed their economy in just one generation. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, that is. It's super fascinating to see how, how much the, that global economy has changed. Yeah. Um, I, there's an audience question I want to get to in a second, but I have sort of a segue transitionary type question to, to maybe build on something you talked about before. You, you've talked about 5G, you talked about metaverse, you've, you've hit on some specific technologies that it can enable industry 4.0 and or 5.0 in the future. What are some of the technology, some of the additional technologies that really constitute industry 4.0, 4.0, like MES and some of the other technologies that sort of fit into that ecosystem? So it's 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 really two things. It's 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 the minimum technical requirements of the technology, and then it's the cap and then it's the capability. So I want to I want to I'll answer the question by starting starting with I, I kind of want to encapsulate what are some of the challenges that manufacturers have because it has to do with this technology piece. Be prior to the year two thousand, all network infrastructure for the most part was master slave, cl server client pull response right. Serial communications were king all the way up until 2000. And what does that basically mean? It means that you used one common pair of wires. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to generalize here. 
used a common pair of wires to collect all data. Mm -hmm. And that was done through transmission and receipt, right? TXRX, serial communications. So you could only get a response from a smart thing, one smart thing at a time. Okay. So you had to make a request and then the smart thing would respond and you would get that. And that request had to originate somewhere. The master or the server had to request that data. That's serial communications. Okay. Highly, incredibly inefficient. In the late 1990s, and, and this is the reason that oil, oil and gas companies, water, wastewater facilities, all the people who were out in the middle of nowhere couldn't collect their data because they had, they had a little tiny amount of bandwidth and they were trying to make, pass all these requests out to, you know, from a server. They were making requests out over these networks. They could only get one response at a time. Third of the time, they're disconnected, so they're just sitting there timing out. And most of the data they were requesting didn't change. 90% 90, uh, 90 of all data in your infrastructure doesn't change at least once per minute. 90% of all the data points don't change at least once per minute. And they were requesting them every second or every five seconds. So there are four, there are four um, principles of Industry 4.0 technology. Number one, it has to be edge-driven. That is the smart thing has to notify you of its data, not you request, Okay. Right. Number two, it's got to be report by exception. You only send the things that change. Number three, it has to be open architecture. That is all it has to be on. It has to be a technology that isn't owned by anyone. Okay. Right. And number four, it has to be lightweight. That is it has. And in, 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 so the in the late 1990s, the, 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 the premier technology was developed in the late 1990s by a guy named Arlen Nipper. He's the most famous inventor of this technology and Andy Stanford Clark, who was at IBM at the time. Actually, I think I, he's still at IBM and Arlen is the, he's, I, he's the CTO at Cirrus link. They created a technology for Philips 66 called MQTT. Everyone is familiar with it because if you use iPhone messenger, if you do iMessage or you use uh, Facebook messenger, when someone's typing and you get those little ellipses, right? You can see that the other person is typing that's MQTT. Right. It's a stateful edge driven technology. So um, we use MQTT for nearly everything in, in, in infrastructure wise, but it's not the only technology. The only reason we use MQTT is because it's edge driven report by exception, lightweight open architecture. You could use AMQP, which was developed by Microsoft. You can use DNP3, which is really common in the energy industry. You have to use a broker technology that will allow the smart thing to publish its data to you. Only the stuff that changed, super lightweight, and in a in an infrastructure where anything else who supports that minimum that technology can consume it, right? The most manufacturers have that old technology, e even if they're on Ethernet cables. So even if they are on a local area network over category six cables, they're no longer using Data Highway Plus, they're no longer using explicit serial, the underlying technology is still based on serial. It's still mm -hmm. server client. It's still poll response. And uh, there's a really common question uh, response I get here, which is, hey, Walker, what about subscriptions and OPC UA? What about sending up subscriptions? Well, all a subscription is, is a cheat. <laughs> it's still instantiated by the server. The server has to subscribe, not the client setting up a subscription on behalf of the entire infrastructure, right? So in order for you to become one of these smart companies, you know, connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize, and then find patterns, predict, report, and solve, you have to have, A, a concise digital strategy, okay? You have to pick the right technology so that you can scale, okay? And you got to use the right partners, the ones who will do all the projects, do all the use cases, solve all the problems using the right technology and in service of your digital strategy. That the, in, in a nutshell... That's what it is. Those are that that is the technology driven approach for industry 4.0. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, thanks for that that overview. And and I think uh, that's a good holistic view without getting too caught up in specific technologies. Well, like I, imagine imagine you're a machine builder. Th this is the best example. Imagine you're a machine builder. Okay. I build okay. a piece of equipment for a manufacturer. What is the old way of integrating that piece of equipment into your business. Okay. And if you're an executive who works at a manufacturer, you should be asking your OEMs this question. 
What data do you have available? And how is that going to be integrated into our business? Okay. Not how is that machine just going to do its functional role, but what data is on that piece of equipment we can collect and how is it going to integrate? Okay. So the old way of doing it is the machine builder only gave a shit about the functional specification, functional acceptance test at the end. Does it do all the functions it's supposed to do? There's nothing on there about data. There's nothing on there about how, collecting that data or plugging into infrastructure. There's none of that stuff. Okay. And how do I know? Because I was an engineer who worked for the end user who spec'd out all the equipment. And I was always blown away by the fact that we never asked what data is available and how are we going to collect it? So what would happen is they put that machine on the plant floor. Then all of a sudden they realize, you know what? We need status on this machine. The, this, this machine is down too much and it's, it's screwing up our operations. We need to collect data from it. Well, how do we do that? Now we bring in an integrator. We spend a couple hundred thousand dollars. The integrator learns what data is on there, and then they figure out what technology they can collect, and then they collect it, and they put it in its own little data silo, and here you go. No, the f this is what OEMs in the ind in industry 4.0 OEMs do. They, they give you a document that tells you, here's all the data that's on this piece of equipment. Here's how it's organized. Think of it as a tree structure. And they say, when we install it, you're going to show us where your broker is located. Give me the IP address of that broker, the username and the password. We're going to point that machine to the infrastructure. And the moment we flip the switch, the data just streams into the infrastructure. It, no additional cost, no additional integration time, no anything. That is Industry 4.0. It's not spending a year building a supervisory control and data acquisition system with manufacturing execution that's custom to just that that machine. It's plug the machine in, point it to the infrastructure, flip the switch on and data streams. Right. Right. So how about this? Here's a, here's a question from uh, YouTube that, that I feel like we could spend the whole interview talking just about this one question, but what are some of the pitfalls that companies go through in their journey to a smart company and how to avoid it? So all the stuff you're talking about that industry 4.0, what are some of the biggest pitfalls that companies face when they're trying to get to this point? And you're absolutely right. I mean, we could spend forever going over this. All right. So I'll try to be as concise as I, I possibly can here. Um, it, it really starts with um, strategy. Okay. You, manu organizations only fail for three reasons. And by the way, the vast majority of manufacturers who set out to digitally transform and what is digital transformation? It's going from an industry 3.0 company to an industry 4.0 company. It's not digitizing eat travelers. It's not, you know, taking, turning everything from paper into a digital interface. That's a subset. That's digitization. That's a subset of digital transformation. Digital transformation is all about becoming a smart company. Okay. That is, an, right. and what is a smart company? It's a company that learns from its data natively. Okay. That is, it gets, we optimize our processes through the collection, the storage, the analysis, and the reporting of the digital data all across our organization. Everybody wants to do predictive analytics. I want to predict failures of equipment. Well, okay, hire a data scientist and um, test this hypothesis. You know, I want to see, I want to be able to monitor this temperature sensor and predict the failure on this process, this value X for that value Y, right? That's right. easy crap. That's easy. Smart, that's easy stuff. Any idiot data scientist can do that. You, you could have a 1.9 GPA when you graduated from college as a data scientist, and you could do that linear regression. It doesn't matter who you hire for that one. The real value in machine learning and artificial intelligence is finding the hypotheses you should test. That is come, looking for patterns in data that you can't see with the naked eye. Corollaries between data points you never thought were related. That's what machine learning and artificial intelligence really does for a smart company. So why do they fail? Wrong strategy, wrong technology, wrong partners. Those are the only three reasons. If you look at why organizations fail, it's because they try to do digital transformation the way they do everything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they want to do a top down. They take a person who they think is a subject matter expert. They put them in charge of everything and they approach everything as a standalone project. They go to McKinsey, they go to Cognizant, they go to Rockwell and they say, hey, help us digitally transform. And they come in and they, they spend a million dollars a month al analyzing the business. And what you get from them is a 100 page document. That's exactly the same 100 page document they gave to the last customer. 99% of it's the same. It's got a list of projects that they want you to pay them to do. And none of them are interrelated. <laughs> so it, 
we, you, digital transformation is all about approaching every project as one part of a bigger whole on that common strategy. Okay. So what I'm building today stands on the shoulders of what I built yesterday. And what I build today is the foundation upon which what I do tomorrow will be built. Okay. That starts with education. So number one, digital transformation starts with education. That, and, and this is one of the biggest arguments I have with people all the time. You take a legacy organization and you say, go digitally transform. They have no idea what to do. They have to be taught first. Part of our strategy as an integrator was we'll do the work in the beginning at the same time while we're educating you. And within a 24-month window, you own this. You take over. Your people take over. And, in, and then you just iterate and solve your problems as a smart company. The biggest challenge is, though, companies are led by the wrong people. That At the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. You need transformative and disruptive leadership. And that leadership and that transformative and disruptive leader has to be a technical person. You and I were talking about this earlier, right before we went live. You know, I was developing yesterday. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I own 49 companies. I'm a super busy guy. I work 110 hours a week and I develop every single week. I, I write code every single week. Why? Because industry 4.0 companies have to lead, be led by te uh, technological leaders, people who understand the technology. Elon, Elon Musk, I I wealthiest guy on the planet, he's still in engineering meetings every day. He, every single day, he is solving the actual problems. He stays close to the technology. Why? Because the CEO of the future is a technologist. It's not an accountant. It's not a finance person. It's a technologist. It's an engineer. It's a software developer. It's a data scientist. It's someone who understands how to leverage data, transform it into information, and build applications that sit on top of that information to make us better. The old legacy model, what the biggest hurdle was the CEO knew nothing about the tech. He could barely turn on his laptop and he would just delegate. He would delegate technological solutions to the IT department that would then operate like the Gestapo and they would do everything top down. They wouldn't solve people's problems on the plant floor up and we'd get nowhere. That's how you got that bifurcation of IT and OT. Why? Because operations is all about production and IT is all about security and compliance. The organization of the future, IT, is all about data enablement. They're a service organization that works to converge operational technology with the information technology into one common ecosystem. Yeah. It's your biggest challenge. Yeah, very interesting. And I and I was I'm glad you brought up the the coding uh, case study of you you doing some coding still, because I think that that was as we talked about that before we went live. I didn't have time to fully process that before we hit the live button, but um, it did make me think that you know it, it's like you've got to have a combination of that strategic vision of just the you know business models, where our industry is headed, what what our customers need and want. So that that sort of traditional executive mindset. But what you're saying is you also need that bottoms up to sort of com combine and, and complete the picture, not just having that that high level ivory tower vision of the future, but also how could the technology work in ways we haven't even thought of yet because it, it just at the, at the top, it's strategy and vision. At the bottom is are the problems you start with. The smartest right. people. Let me let me say that. And Eric, by the way, we have about five dozen or so on our on our channel right now watching uh, 63. Uh, I want to make sure we we pass along your contact info, that question. Right. Okay. Right. Um, the um, top down is strategy and vision. The smartest people in any organization, let me say this again. If, and I ask this question when I meet with leaders, when I go in front of the board of directors, question number one, literally question number one is, do you believe you are the smartest people in your organization? And I, I get the board, of, I get the chief technical officer, I get the CEO, I get the CFO to admit they are not the smartest people in the organization. I make them say it. If they don't, I leave. I just walk out. You're dead. You're dead. You're absolutely dead. Um, the smartest people in your organization are the people who do the actual work. They may not talk like you. They may not have the degrees that you have. Okay. They may not have read good to great. They may not have went, read how to win friends and influence people. They, they may not think quickly on their feet, but they sure as fuck know more about your operation than you do. Right. They know all your problems. And what you want to do is start digital transformation by solving their problems. Why? Because if you solve their problems, you're solving the business's problems at scale by extension. The biggest mistake organizations make 
is they put somebody in the ivory tower in charge of owning digital transformation. And then it's their ideas. They're, they're the gatekeeper. No, no, no. They are the enabler. They are the service organization for solving the problems on the plant floor. That's, sure. that's who they are. That's when I talk about those first two, those two huge steps. Step number one, that connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize, find patterns, predict, report, solve. That three to five year first big step, that's all solving plant floor problems. Step right. two, plugging into digital supply chain, that's your business problem. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's fascinating. Now, do you do you ever have um, get along that line of of the front line people being the smartest people in the organization? On the flip side, do you ever run into situations where those people are going to resist this industry 4.0 yep. mentality because it could be perceived as a threat to their jobs? And and actually, they might have the exact opposite. They think the the impact might be the exact opposite of what you're trying to accomplish. Back to your mission statement of saving middle-class jobs. It seems like technology can be a threat to people at times. So how do you bridge that gap between what the end result will be and what people's perceived end result might be in, in, in the negative way? That does come up occasionally, but very rarely. You know the biggest objection from the rank and file? Oh, we've What's heard that? this. Before. We've heard this before. Flavor of the month. Oh, right. I've heard this. This is just, this is a, you know, new, new color, different week. Um, this is a new executive who came in who's got a big idea and they're not going to solve any problems. Flavor of the month is their biggest objection. But let's let me answer your question directly, though. For the people who do say, well, aren't I going to aren't I basically going to engineer myself out of my, out of a job? No, I use the Coca-Cola example. I use I use the example of the companies who are more advanced here. If you look at Coke, they have dark facilities, right, where they have the lights off, where they're bottling. They don't have fewer employees in those facilities. They have more. <laughs> the control room is full of people analyzing data. And guess who's analyzing that data? Guess who's analyzing those processes? The people who used to work on the machines. Do you know every organ, you go to talk to any manufacturer, you go to talk to any manufacturer and you say, do you have more people than you need? Do you have less people than you need? Do you have open jobs that you can't fill? And the answer is yes. And if you ask them why they can't fill them, it's only one of two reasons. Either they can't find the right person or they don't have the capital. They don't have the funding to do it. You know what they do the moment They've engineered you out of a dangerous position, uh, out of a position where you're just flipping boxes with your foot. They take you and they reappropriate you into that position they can't they can't fill. That's what happens. And they start investing in that in that middle analysis layer of the organization, which is where all the efficiency gains are captured. And then what's the first thing that happens when you capture efficiency gains in a transformative economy? You capture market share, you grow, and you add more people. And it's a net gain. And by the way, you, you can just look at the data here. Go ahead and look at Industry 4.0 companies. Look at their growth pattern. Look at the number of people they have per dollar generated. And then look at look at Industry 3.0 companies. Don't take my word for it. Right. It, yeah. they, this creates jobs, net jobs, net gains. Yeah. And I think painting that vision of what those people are going to be doing and, and helping transition them, I think that's really the key from a, from a change perspective to make sure that they you know, you alleviate and mitigate some of those fears. You, you uh, Andrew Oswald's question. Can we, do you have that one on the chat? Do you see that one? Uh, is uh, that the last one here, this uh, right here. Already started? Yeah, this is a good one. So yeah. if you've already started doing digitalization projects, but now realize you took the wrongish approach, how do you breach that topic with leaders to correct course without losing faith in you? It's a great question. The answer is making mistakes is part of the problem. Okay. It, it, or making mistakes is part of the process. Listen, we learn nothing from success. We, I, let, me, let me say that again. As a sociologist, we human beings learn absolutely nothing from success. We don't learn a thing. We learn everything through failure. Right. You need to embrace the challenge. You need, to, you need to go into every single day. You need to work for an organization that wants you to make mistakes. You know, uh, One of my mentors used to tell me this. If you haven't screwed up lately, you're not taking enough risk. If you, uh, there are business leaders who say, if you've never filed for bankruptcy, you're not taking enough risk. I, I disagree there, but it, it's the same thing in technology. If you you fail, you make them you you screw up six times for every one win. You got the win because you screwed up six times. You have to work for an organization that embraces that. There was this great company in Indiana that we worked with. The chief executive officer's mantra was "Ready, fire, aim." Make mistakes, recover quickly. That's literally what he would tell his people. 
You need to be working in an organization that doesn't punish you for making a mistake. Okay. Now, if you make 60 mistakes in a row with no win, that's not a positive trend. That's a negative trend. You got to let that, you got to reappropriate, reeducate, whatever you got to do. But you need to understand that when we talk about agility and digital transformation, which we do, I haven't mentioned it here. Agility is all about adjusting to the changing winds. Digital transformation is about exponentially increasing the collective knowledge of an organization. If you were going to distill it down, that's what it is. By converting data into information and getting it into the hands of any consumer who wants it, when they want it, where they want it, in the format they need it, okay? You are going to exponentially increase the collective knowledge of an organization. Hmm. And where you, where you started in digital transformation was a function of what the organization knew at that time. What you want is a function of what you know. As you get smarter, what you want changes exponentially. You have to be working in an organization with a transformative and disruptive leader who not only understands that, but embraces it. Right. So if you tell me, if you tell me you work in a place where you've got to, um, you have to have a fear of, of, of telling your leadership that we need, we need to do a course adjustment, you work for the wrong organization. Right. Right. So that's great, great advice. And, and I guess just sort of to bring this all full circle and, and we're, we're at the top of the hour and I feel like we could easily talk about this for three to four to five hours. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, what what advice would you give to a manufacturing company that's not there yet? And I think it's safe to say most manufacturing organizations are not there yet in terms of fully adopting and embracing Industry 4.0. What what advice would you give to a manufacturer that's about to get started on that journey and they're, or they're struggling to get there? I'd say th uh, three things. So number one, you have to change the way you approach solving your problems in your organization. So that is um, it, when you when you use your consultants and your integrators, you need to use con you need to use a consultant or an architect who is wholly agnostic. Okay, mm -hmm. that and 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 so let's say let's say I've got a systems integrator I'm working with, and that systems integrator is a Rockwell integrator or they're a Siemens integrator. Doesn't mean don't don't keep working with them. What it means is you don't allow them to architect your solution. You hire a agnostic consultant who is your architect, who is going to design a technology driven approach that that integrator will build solutions to meet using minimum technical requirements. So you have to change the way you approach your problems. Number two, join our discord server before you do anything. Just go to our discord server. You can go to iot.university forward slash discord. That Discord server is full of all the people all over the world who are doing these solutions. And we're, we're talking theory. We're, we're talking minimum technical requirements. We're talking everything. Okay. Go in there and become more fluent in what Industry 4.0 actually is before you spend any money. And then number three, start with a digital transformation maturity assessment. Okay. You need, and, and, and we have a model that our, all of our members use. So we're not the only ones who do it. 4.0 Solutions isn't the only company that does DTMAs. In fact, Michael Dowdell does it, uh, Dave Schultz, Mario Shigawa. There are many members of our community who use our methodology to assess organizations. And that assessment starts with 10 pillars for Industry 4.0 and then scores you against the rest of the companies in the data set at this point, which is like 1,400 manufacturers. So you know exactly where you stand relative to the other companies in the assessment. And then you quantify where you are, where you want to go, you design an architecture, and then you start iterating. One use case at a time built on common technology. That's what you need to do. If, if there's any mistake I've seen organizations make, they try to bite off way more than they can chew. They want everything done three days ago. Um, and they don't embrace the, 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 the truism that you are going to get smarter during this process. And as you get smarter, what you want is going to change. And you and you have to lay the foundation for being able to adjust to that all in the beginning. So number, number one, um, change the way you think. Number two, join our Discord server. So immerse yourself in the thinking, okay? Number three, start with a digital transformation maturity assessment. You, if you, we, I say to my, my team all the time, if a company doesn't have a digital strategy, that is, they don't have a three sentence statement that says this is our digital strategy and they don't have an architecture that's been designed by an industry 4.0 architect, 
then they're starting with a DTMA, period, full stop. We're not doing anything for them without the DTMA. Yeah, because it, it sort of gives you a sense of where you're starting from, right? You can't really get to where you want to go unless you know. Well, it's all about taking the wool off your eyes. It's all right. about shh, this is where you really are and this is where you really want to go. Yeah, here are the pitfalls, here are the landmines, and here's what we've got to get past to get there. Um, if you go to te if you call, you could call anybody who works at Tesla right now and you could ask them, what is your digital strategy? What is Tesla's digital strategy? They'll be able to recite it from memory. Every single employee. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. So it's it's embedded in the DNA of that company. It's not a separate initiative. It's not a separate work stream that's sort of working in parallel. It's it's embedded in their day to day. It, it's the so it's the soap they wash with every morning. The water they the the water they drink every day. Yeah, yeah, and that's great advice too. I think too often we think of transformation as something we're just going to delegate off to the side. Here we're going to let this PMO run that project and just let not us know if you need anything. Rule, rule number one in digital transformation. Digital transformation is not a project. It's a strategy. It's a it's a yeah. strategy for the way you run your business. Yeah. Strategy, yeah. business model, mindset, all that stuff you've talked about. Right. Exactly. That's great. So how, how can, uh, I know we're streaming to both uh, your platforms, my platforms. How do people get a hold of you for those that aren't familiar with who you are? So uh, the best place, uh, you can go to, you can look up 4.0 Solutions on their YouTube channel. You can go to iiot.university. Um, you can go to intellicintegration.com. Uh, you can go to LinkedIn. We, I mean, you know, you can DM me on discord. You can, um, message me on LinkedIn. Um, and then, uh, I think we have a contact email or whatever. I think, you know, but I, I have a team that that'll, if, if, if I'm the person you're supposed to talk to, they steer you right. They steer you right to me. Um, and, uh, but we, I mean, we have a huge team, you know, on the Intellic and 4.0 solution side. And then also we have member, you know, member, uh, integrators, uh, John McKeon's on here from um, um, John McKeon, who is the he's the principal at Gallerus Solutions in Ireland. He's one of our integrator partners. So whenever anyone calls us from Western Europe, we're always talking to them in Western Europe in conjunction with GIS. We have Mario Ishigawa from Pack IoT. He's based out of Brazil. Same concept. Uh, Dave Schultz, who's out of Chicago. Same concept with Dave. Uh, it, Mexico is going to be Michael Dowdell you know, and, and it's on and on and on and on. Yep. So you've built a whole, a whole network of uh, resources here. Uh, Correct. Is, yeah. And for those that don't know who I am, my name is Eric Kimberling. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can also go to our website, uh, thirdstage-consulting.com. And you can also find me on all the typical uh, social media channels. I have a YouTube channel as well. So if you just search Eric Kimberling there, as well as a TikTok and Instagram uh, accounts too, where I just put out daily stuff related to digital transformation. So encourage you to check that out too. So I want to thank you, Walker, for being on the show. This is a super interesting conversation. One of the most fun ones I've done, to be quite honest with you. And it, and it flew by. I can't believe it's already been an hour, but it, but it has been. So we're, I definitely want to have you back on again, because I've got a whole list of questions here on my side. And I know the audience had a bunch of questions we didn't, we didn't get to. So I'd love to have you on the show again at some point in the future. So, And I really appreciate you inviting me, Ma, inviting me on, man. This was a lot of fun. Well, good. Good. Glad you, glad you, you could do it. And um, I'll look forward to having you on again. And I want to thank the audience for all the great questions. A really uh, awesome audience today. Great, great engagement. So really appreciate that. And again, you can find, uh, we do this live stream every Tuesday at the same time. You can find this interview. We're going to edit, edit it, polish it up and make it part of our transformation ground control podcast, which comes out every Wednesday. So a week from tomorrow, that new episode will come out, which will feature Walker as sort of the, the centerpiece interview, but we have a bunch of other content we'll add to it in the meantime. Um, so thanks again to everyone for being here. Hope you all have a great day and we will see you next time. See you guys.